Vikings thought it tops a thousand years ago when they started making annual visits. Admittedly, they knocked it about a bit and tended to leave without paying until they came back and settled for good. And much the same thing is happening today. For many who first come as tourists are so captivated, they return to join the island people. Our new arrivals are eagerly out and across to the waiting coaches. And from the moment of arrival, it's flowers all the way as they start their first journey on this enchanted isle, swinging away from the airport on the drive to Douglas, capital of the island and its main holiday center. Here, their fellow holidaymakers are already enjoying themselves, strolling through the lovely promenade gardens, soaking up the sunshine. Two girls move along rather more purposefully, determined not to miss a thing. But this chap is not quite so energetic. It's a bit too hot for all that effort. Some of his friends have decided to relax in Villa Marina Garden, listening to the bands and entertainers, or just thoroughly enjoying themselves doing nothing in particular. The horse cars provide transport with a difference, of course, but in the Isle of Man, they are far from alone in this. There are, of course, modern coaches waiting to take visitors to all parts of the island, for there is much to see. The new car ferries, too, make it easy for the many who bring their own cars, while others prefer to use the fleets of hire cars. But in the realm of transport, as in so many other ways, the Isle of Man provides the unusual. For instance, a unique Victorian railway. Here, a pretty ticket collector in Victorian costume takes your ticket. And another sees you to your carriage. Then, with a wave from the engine driver, the quaint, narrow-gauge train pulls out of Douglas Station, travelling south. Mounting problems, including that of rolling stock, make the future of the railway problematical. But whether by train or not, it's well worth heading south to Balasala, an attractive village on the southern line, and take time out here for a look at two particular attractions. First is Silverdale, one of the many Manx National Glens, with yet another unusual method of going places, but this time without going anywhere at all except round in circles for the Glen has a roundabout driven by a miniature water wheel, and you can bet it's a smash hit with the youngster. The big wheel outside the old mill turns as it has done for over 400 years, but inside, where once the busy millers handled grain from surrounding farms, the ferries have taken over, turning the old building into a miniature fairy land. They certainly keep well and truly to the grindstone. In fact, the only strike here is when the electricity fails. This one's checking the overdraft to see if they can afford a rest, for even the fairies have to have a holiday. And this chap has decided it's time to relax. He's not alone either, for only a few hundred yards away at Russian Abbey, much the same thing is going on in the warm glow of summer sunshine. The grounds of this once powerful abbey are now famous for their magnificent flower garden, where you can stroll at your leisure, or if you're in a gay mood, join in open-air dancing to the resident band. Famous, too, for their generous helpings of freshly picked strawberries with whipped cream. So go on, forget your figure. And for their history. For here are buried many of the Norse kings from the days when the Vikings ruled the land. And here, too, monks chronicled much of the known history of the island and its people. The charm of Manxland is evident in the air of easy relaxation belying the efficient organization behind the scenes. And at Russian Abbey, nothing seems more natural than that children and adults should be relaxing happily amidst the gaunt grey ruins. Two miles further south, 
In the old island capital of Castletown, more grey battlements dominate the skyline, but this time no ruin, for this is one of the finest medieval fortresses in Britain, Castle Russian. Here, Robert the Bruce conquered in the 14th century, and 250 years later, the Countess of Derby defied Cromwell's troops in the Civil War. The fascinating single-handed clock was given by Queen Elizabeth I, and the ingenious mechanism can be seen in the castle, which is quite an experience. For the guide is happy to let you try some of the medieval toys they have. Though whether your memories are magic or not depends on which side of the chopper you're on. Fort Erin, too, has more than its fair share of silver sands and clear, sparkling blue waters. Waters much favored by skin divers because of their Mediterranean clarity and the wealth of underwater life they contain. And it's here, where the small ships ply at Port Erin, that we meet yet another form of island transport. This time, a short sea trip to the Calf of Man, a small island lying off the south of the Isle of Man itself. So let's waste no time in getting aboard, for only limited numbers can make this trip at any one time, and it's not to be missed. Once away from the jetty, the boat swings gently out across the bay, past rock and cliff, and 20 minutes later slides deftly into a tiny harbor on the Calf of Man. The Calf of Man is a bird sanctuary, watched over by two wardens, expert ornithologists in their own right, who track and record the bewildering variety of native and migrant birds using the safety of the calf. Stop a while and gaze back over the magnificent seascapes along the west of the Isle of Man before starting the short walk across the island, for there are no vehicles here, to its farthest point. And a glorious walk it is, through heather and gorse, fern and flower. Here is a strange cluster of lighthouses, built through the years to warn shipping. Ruins of two old lights stand solidly yet, looking over the sea to Chicken's Rock Lighthouse, which was damaged by fire some years ago, and has now been replaced by one of the most modern lights in the British Isles. A light visible more than 23 miles out to sea, and used as a navigation mark by air as well as sea traffic. But don't stay too long, for on the way back you must have spare time to call in at the warden's lonely house. For as well as looking after the wildlife and the bird life of the calf of man, part of their duty is to operate one of Britain's most remote post offices a sea mail service with its own special stamps and franking. Here you can chat to the wardens, get information about the calf, or make your friends envious by sending them a postcard from way off the beaten track. Ah, going to visit Peel next. That's an excellent idea. So let's join in, for Peel is a mellow old town nestling on the west coast of the Isle of Man, and dominated by the red sandstone ruins of Peel Castle, an historic fortress stormed by the Viking raiders a thousand years ago when they conquered and ruled the island for over two centuries. Peel has long been the base of the Manx fishing industry too, and though the fishing fleet no longer musters the hundreds of ships it once did, fishing remains one of the town's great attractions. And whether out in small boats, from the rocks behind the castle, or from the breakwater itself, specially equipped for fishermen, by the way, there are always enthusiasts trying their luck with rod and line. Up she comes. And down she goes into the new swim pool. This recently built pool is an ever popular spot for sunbathers, for it lies in a natural sun trap facing the castle across the bay. And for those who like to go as far as getting wet, its heated waters make life very, very pleasant too. If that were rain, they would be complaining. Back in Douglas, the holiday scene unfolds, gay and colorful as ever, with the carefree thousands enjoying themselves in whatever fashion they find best. The 
motorists are out on the island 600 miles of road, reveling in the lack of traffic and the spectacular scenery. The more energetic have hired bicycles to see the island the hard way. While the more adventurous have taken to the hills above Baldwin, on the outskirts of Douglas, on a pony trekking expedition. Yet another variation on the theme of transport in the Isle of Man. For here, the kiddies are having a marvellous time. This is their world. And here, they will happily play for hours, digging the soft sands and trying to beat Canute at holding back the tide with sand castles. Castles down and castles up. For here at Derby Castle, once the site of a famous variety theatre at the north end of Douglas Promenade, is taking shape one of the most exciting holiday projects in the world. A complete complex of entertainment undercover to keep Douglas ahead in the holiday field, whatever the weather might do. The first part of this futuristic two million pound scheme, the swimming pool, is near completion. Skilled engineers have shaped and bolted the cliff face for much use is to be made of natural settings, and the imaginative architectural ideas have set difficult engineering problems. Entrance to the complex will be across a modern concrete flyover from the promenade, and going from the reality to this detailed model shows us what is to come. There will be spacious car parks, verandas, and terraces of entertainment surrounding the center itself. And if we can have the roof off a moment, thank you, we can look in. A first class indoor swim pool with all the latest ideas and facilities. And alongside it, the key to the scheme, a solarium where artificial sunshine will give that gorgeous tan even if it is raining. Cascading waterfalls will use the cliff face as backing and there will be terraces of entertainment. Even an artificial beach lapped by the waters of its own blue lagoon. One of the most advanced projects in the world, this is an expensive idea but the Manx believe in looking ahead with the most modern, while maintaining that which gives their island its individual charm and character. So typically it is here, cheek by jowl with the ultra-modern, that we find yet another quaint means of continuing our island journey, the Manx Electric Railway, which for more than 70 years has carried holidaymakers between Douglas and Ramsey to some of the most lovely of the Manx countryside. This is essentially a gentle journey, without any pretense at express rushing about, and all the more enjoyable for that. And you can hop off to explore glens or quiet beaches where smugglers once plied their twilight trade. And don't forget to step off at Laxey and change to one of the Snaefell mountain cars for a trip up the island's only mountain a trip taken by over 50,000 visitors every year. From sea level to over 2,000 feet, the car climbs the shoulders of Snaefell, with breathtaking vistas of much of the island's 230 square miles spreading below. Once at the top, you can enjoy a meal, a snack, or a drink in the mountain hotel. But most take some time to get that far, for they are immediately captivated by the marvellous scenery, looking down across hill and valley out to the sea, where cars look like toys on the mountain road. At the summit, a triangulation point used in ordnance survey work carries a map to show where you are in relation to what the Manx people call the adjacent islands. The Manx people also say that from here you can see six kingdoms. Those of England, Ireland, Scotland, Wales, and man itself, plus the kingdom of heaven. From here, all roads northward, including this part of the famous TT course, lead to Ramsey yet another island holiday resort and queen of the northern plain, where the splendid Murak Park draws tourists with its fine lake and semi-tropical settings of palm trees and exotic flowers. 
This is a garden playground by the sea and captivates all ages. For children, it is a never-ending delight, allowing their high-spirited happiness free reign and the 101 things for them to do. Their older brothers and sisters relax under the palms or enjoy the lake. this time of the flamingos at the wildlife park, a newcomer in the increasing chain of island attractions. The park is not intended as a full-scale zoo, but rather as a collection of the more interesting and colorful smaller animals and birds, which can be seen in spacious natural settings, including walk-through aviaries and pens, allowing both visitor and animal a great measure of freedom. As well as wildlife cabaret, there's a colourful nightlife cabaret from birds of a very different feather as Douglas swings into his gay and lively entertainment after dark, and the theatres and dance halls come alive. The promenades are ablaze with a million lights as the holiday capital goes gay from dusk to five o'clock in the morning, if you can stand the pace. wine and dine in elegant restaurants with top flight cuisine and service, for here you can enjoy yourself through to the dawn. Refreshed and ready, then the town is yours, with shows, dances, laughter and glamour through the midnight hours, until, with the sun rising again on the bay, it's time to say good night and goodbye. For holidays, too, must end, yet not entirely, for, like all the pleasant things of life, they live long and happily in memory and photograph. So it is that, as the ships and planes swing out to cross the Irish Sea, they take with them an invisible cargo. They take something of the scenes and sounds, the quiet loveliness and the gay excitement of an island in the sun. An appreciation, too, of the natural courtesy and hospitality of the Manx people, and the infinite variety and charm of an island which needs far more than one visit to know it and to enjoy it to the full. They take with them a million magic memories.